Okay, so I'm going to talk about machine learning for detector simulation on behalf of Atlas, CMS, and LHCB. Uh, so I think we've already gone over these plots probably a few times this week, but just as a reminder that uh, the experiments are facing extreme computing challenges uh, as the upcoming runs of the LHC approach uh, for CMS and Atlas, the amount of CPU needed uh, significantly exceeds uh, the amount that we expect to have available based on the usual 10 to 20% annual resource increase, which is shown here. And for LHCB, uh, in fact, the problem uh, starts even earlier in run three. Now, in particular, this motivates uh, some work on the simulation, and I'll explain why. At uh, the beginning of run two, uh, during the original HSF white paper effort, we found that the full detector simulation using GN4 took about 40%, which is a plurality of grid CPU resources for CMS and Atlas. Um, we know that the detector upgrade to the HLLHC will increase the complexity of the detectors, and therefore it'll take longer to simulate them. And based on uh, the GNV exercise, as well as other factors, we expect the improvements, uh, further technical improvements, uh, to be limited when it comes to making GN4 faster. Though, of course, there are still places we can gain. You know, we no longer expect to be able to get a factor of five to 10 or more just uh, improving the existing libraries. On the other side, we have to keep in mind that the reconstruction CPU usage scales super linearly with pileup. And this means it's going to take a much larger fraction. Uh, of the available CPU uh, going into the future runs of the LHC. So the upshot is that simulation needs to deliver more events with more complexity while using a smaller fraction of CPU. And as I said, for LHCB, uh, the detailed simulation exceeds the available CPU even for run three. Um, and so here I show the, CP, the CMS and Atlas uh, pie charts looking at different contributions to uh, the CPU for uh, the HLHC startup, and you can see that the amount of time uh, has shrunk quite a bit. You know, here for CMS, we're projecting about 5%, whereas before we had 40%. Uh, and I think Atlas is projecting a bit more, but still uh, definitely needs to fit into a smaller fraction. So just a brief overview of the classical simulation engines, uh, so it's clear what I mean when I'm talking about these things. Uh, for full sim, we mean GN4. Uh, this is, of course, a common software framework, and experiments can provide additional code via user actions. It explicitly models the detector geometry, materials, and interactions with particles. And it has physics lists that include many models of particle interactions for different energy ranges and different effects and so forth. Uh, then we have what I'll call FastSim. Uh, usually, this is an experiment-specific framework. And it implements approximations uh, such as analytical shower shapes based on G flash uh, parameterization, uh, potentially you know, other things like truth assisted track reconstruction and so forth. And then finally, we have DELFS, which is an ultra fast parametric simulation commonly used for pheno studies, uh, future predictions, and so forth. So, moving into the machine learning topic, uh, specifically generative machine learning. Uh, Algorithms like deep neural networks are typically trained for classification or regression tasks, but they can also do generation tasks, i.e. creating novel output from some input. Um, industry has demonstrated impressive but not foolproof, foolproof results, uh, such as uh, StyleGAN2, which can generate images, and GPT-3, which can generate text. Uh, here I have an example of some faces generated by StyleGAN2. Uh, so on the left, we have a good example. Uh, so this is a generated person's face. This person does not actually exist. It comes from this person does not exist.com. And on the right, we have a bad example where it looks mostly like a face, but you can see at the bottom, there's some weird thing going on uh, where it didn't uh, quite learn enough to be able to avoid artifacts like this occurring occasionally. And obviously, th if you had this sort of thing happening in a physics simulation, you wouldn't trust the results. So now looking specifically at machine learning for simulation, uh, there are some pros and there are some potential cons. We have to keep this in mind. We can achieve hopefully higher accuracy than simple fast simulations while still producing faster results than GN4. Um, in particular, machine learning inference can be accelerated on coprocessors like GPUs, but also potentially FPGAs and other uh, new devices. And in particular, this uh, gives us an avenue to utilize HPCs, which as we've discussed, will rely on GPUs. Uh, and machine learning code is much more easily portable to GPUs than a lot of classical algorithms. 
And it also lets you generate various quantities. So of course you could generate particle showers, but you could also generate four vectors, particle ID information, uh, high level features and so forth. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Uh, but the cons that we should keep in mind, uh, you may need large training data sets and training time. So the industry example style GAN2 was trained on 25 million images. And this took five to 10 days to train on eight V100 GPUs. So this is not insignificant. And I think any cost benefit analysis of employing machine learning for simulation should include the CPU and GPU usage for training, not just for inference, um, because th this could, in some cases, comprise a substantial fraction of the overall usage. Uh, of course, the statistical validity needs careful consideration. Uh, and especially, a lot of people are concerned that extrapolation outside of the training data set may be unreliable. And so we have to check that very carefully. But I think the, the main point that I want you to take away is that any claim speed up is only meaningful if the results are physically accurate. Because if you're simulating something that isn't physically accurate, it doesn't matter how fast it is, you're not getting the right answer. So this is just another way to present this information and how to keep in mind how uh, machine learning could play several roles in simulation. Uh, you know, here are looking at speed, which you can think of as throughput versus accuracy. You know, you have GM4 based full sim, very high accuracy, but low speed. On the other side, you have DELFs, very fast, uh, but very much lower accuracy than, than uh, full simulation. And machine learning could sort of populate anywhere in this space of uh, still having high speed, but also having high accuracy. You could replace part of full sim, uh, so you would increase the speed while hopefully preserving most of the accuracy. You could replace part of fast sim. Uh, where you might decrease the speed slightly, uh, but increase the accuracy. And there are also uh, a lot of end-to-end -end approaches where you're mapping generated information directly to reconstructed information uh, with no dedicated simulation steps. So this is an interesting alternative, although of course you may be concerned about uh, having to incorporate more rapidly changing information like calibrations and reconstruction algorithms and so forth. So there are a number of techniques uh, in machine learning that can be used to generate events uh, or their information. So of course, there's a generative adversarial network or GAN uh, where you have a discriminator and a generator and the generator is trained to produce an output that the discriminator would uh, classify as real rather than fake. Then there are also variational autoencoders uh, that learn essentially uh, uh, some sort of distribution uh, of the encoded inputs that it can be used to decode uh, to get similar outputs. And therefore, if you have this uh, decoder network, you can generate events that way. You can actually also use a fully connected network uh, to do some sort of kind of regression tasks where you specify exactly uh, the list of input quantities you have and the list of output quantities you want. Again, these could be four vectors or anything else. Uh, this approach can actually be quite useful in some cases. Uh, and there's also uh, one other thing uh, that's a little bit newer that I can mention here, which is a normalizing flow. You may look that you may see that this looks a little bit like an autoencoder, uh, but it actually learns everything as distributions, and this allows it to solve some of the issues that we've seen with other techniques. And so, while I don't have any results on detector simulation to show for this today, I think we'll be seeing results uh, from this technique pretty soon in the future. So first I wanna talk a little bit more about GANs. Uh, they seem like a natural solution. They even have generative in the name, um, but they are difficult to train. Uh, the training is an iterative process. You train the discriminator and then you train the generator and you go back and forth. Uh, this is not mathematically guaranteed to converge. Uh, so you can actually have cases where this just won't converge at all. And otherwise it can be very difficult. Uh, there are other potential problems like mode collapse, um, where the GAN starts to ignore part of the input data and features. So it just it kind of does the easy part, not the hard part. And of course, we want it to be able to do, to do everything. Uh, and there may also be a vanishing gradient problem, um, where because of very small gradients, uh, you're unable to descend and improve the weights in the training. Um, and so this is another reason why the training might not converge. Now, some improvements are possible. Uh, for example, there are alternate loss functions like the Wasserstein loss function that helps avoid these mode collapse and gradient issues, although it doesn't necessarily solve them completely. And this Wasserstein loss function has been shown to improve results in HEP simulation. Uh, so this is a, uh, an image from a paper that investigated the Wasserstein loss function uh, to generate various uh, particle shower 
quantities uh, comparing to JAMP4. And you can see that in general, it does a pretty good job, but there are still some places where the agreement is not so good. Um, and so this suggests that we probably want to go uh, even further into uh, researching more advanced techniques to improve these results. Uh, so here are a few more uh, results from GANs. So you could uh, enhance your GAN a little bit by using a three-dimensional GAN uh, and including some physics terms in the loss function to try to control its output better. Um, in this GAN, they did some uh, profiling of the performance. Uh, so to generate events, uh, it took them about four milliseconds per event on a GPU, whereas GM4 on a CPU was 17 seconds per event. Um, so this is over 4,000 times speed up. And remember, I said the speed up only matters if you get reasonable agreements in physics quantities. And here they generally do get that agreement. Although you can see, for example, uh, this number of hits above some cuts still has some fluctuation. And this is actually a common uh, quantity where you find that GANs don't necessarily reproduce uh, what you expect from GM4 very well. While they can still reproduce some other somewhat higher level quantities as shown here. So you can uh, look even further into GANs and uh, there's been a lot of work on this, especially in the past year or so. Um, there, there was a concern that uh, GANs might not be able to actually give you uh, improvement in your statistical uncertainty beyond uh, the amount of data you have in your training sample. Uh, but here it was demonstrated uh, in a very nice analysis that you can actually show that GANs learn to interpolate uh, inside the data of the training sample. Um, so here, if you just generate some simple shape and then try to reproduce that shape with a GAN, you can see that as you generate more events, you do actually decrease uh, your statistical uncertainty beyond what was in the training sample. Um, so this shows that at least you can hopefully trust your GAN to be able to interpolate, uh, potentially not to extrapolate, but that's a harder problem. But at least here you can actually count on the GAN to reduce your uncertainty and generate more novel events uh, in the space of the training sample. It was also found uh, in what I thought was a particularly nice paper uh, that you can actually improve your GAN results by applying an additional uh, classifier layer on top. Um, so this is called DCTR GAN, and I'll let you read the paper to learn more about that. But essentially, you train this uh, to reweight events after the GAN training finishes. And so it says, okay, the GAN can generate all these kinds of events, but it's not going to generate the right things in the right uh, proportion. So if you reweight the proportions, you'll get a better match to GM4. You can see that this works uh, very well comparing the orange which is what it does uh, without the reweighting to the black, which is what it does with the reweighting. You can see that the black line much better matches the blue histogram, which comes from GM4. Um, and this to me actually highlights uh, an area of research that could even be uh, you know, very fundamental to the underpinnings of GANs in machine learning, not just for our sort of detector simulation problem, which is that it highlights that the discriminator network, which is what helps the GAN learn to discriminate or help the GAN learn to generate uh, realistic images, sometimes uh, downweight certain features very heavily to the point where the GAN no longer learns to do the right thing for those features. And so this probably suggests that there's something more fundamental we can do uh, in the GAN training to avoid that. And hopefully we'll learn how to do that in the next few years. So moving on uh, to some of the other techniques in autoencoders. So a basic autoencoder uh, learns a compressed representation, often called the latent space of the inputs, and then it reconstructs the output. What we call a variational autoencoder, instead of just learning a latent space, it learns the probability distribution of the latent space. Uh, this is better for generative output because it has the whole distribution and not just some very specific space. Uh, but you still need to make sure important information isn't discarded in the process of uh, creating that bottleneck that was shown in the uh, autoencoder diagram. So in this paper, uh, they developed what was called a bounded information bottleneck. And here, this was sort of a generalization and combination of a VAE with a GAN. Um, and the way that this works, to go over it briefly, is that there are several terms in the loss function aimed at the latent space and then several terms aimed at the reconstructed output from the GAN-like part of the network. And those different terms can balance each other uh, in order to get a better output. 
This paper was aimed at uh, ILC imaging calorimeters, uh, which are also similar to the HGCAL that CMS is building based on those uh, ILC CALIS uh, developments. And you can see looking at, again, some of these physical uh, quantities that we like to reproduce from GM4, that the uh, green line, which is the final network, uh, improves a lot on GANs and even the, uh, some other versions of this spending information bottleneck. Uh, approach. Um, and importantly, the green line includes a uh, post-processor network uh, that gives it a better result in some of these quantities. Um, so if, really what we can conclude from these papers is that so far to get a really good physics fidelity, you need uh, sort of several combinations of techniques and, and just using a standard GAN by itself doesn't quite do the job. But I think in the past few years, a lot of progress has been made on getting better to rid of these quantities. And so that's promising. I also mentioned uh, using regression, uh, you know, a fully connected network where you have a, a specified set of outputs that you wanted to predict. Um, so this could be used for simulation or it could be used uh, for an end-to-end -end approach. And here I'm showing some plots from an end-to-end -end approach. Um, and here the idea is to have analysis specific targets. So if you have, if you have a, a specific analysis that you're doing and you know what the backgrounds are and you know what variables you're using, uh, you can sort of set up a network to give you those directly from uh, some generated events. And I think doing this in an analysis specific way is nice because it mitigates concerns about rapidly changing conditions and algorithms. We're not saying the whole experiment has to use this one regression with particular variables, but it's just a way for a specific analysis uh, to get some more simulated events that can help reduce their uncertainties. Um, and here you see that uh, there are cases where the generated information is much different from the reconstructed and the deep learning algorithm uh, does a pretty good job of predicting the reconstructed uh, information just using those generated quantities. Um, there are some other architectures being explored for regression. There are autoregressive networks that are very interesting, but I don't have time to talk about them today. Um, so you can look up some papers on those separately. So focusing now a little more on the experiment perspective. Um, as I had said before, ML for simulation provides a natural avenue to utilize heterogeneous computing resources like GPUs, FPGAs, HPCs, and so forth. Uh, in particular, inference as a service can facilitate this and make it easy to connect to those resources without writing a whole bunch of uh, coprocessor specific code. But we need to balance trade offs in the experiments. So, of course, uh, on the one side, we want to continue to find significant developments in architectures and even mathematical foundations for generative machine learning. This primarily occurs uh, via demonstrations and limited author papers. And it is crucial work toward having ultimately better results uh, that we can rely on. But experiments need solutions implemented and tested for run four at least, and in some cases earlier in run three. Um, this is a much larger scale than limited author papers can achieve. And there are a lot of technical details to be worked out. Uh, you know, is this approach integrated with GM4? Is there a standalone implementation and so forth? Um, so in the experiments, we really have to balance uh, these sort of two approaches to doing things, one focusing on limited author papers and the other focusing on something implemented in the official software. I draw, you need to, Kevin, you need to speed up a bit. Okay. So in Atlas, uh, one thing that they're working on is fast Calogan. Their calorimeter simulation uses the majority of CPU in the full simulation. So here they trained uh, with the detector segmented into 100 ADA slices and separate samples for electrons, photons, and pions. So they have a total of uh, 300 GANs created uh, with this sort of architecture. And you can see that these do actually a very good job uh, at reproducing uh, GM4 uh, distributions and quantities. Uh, this actually is a significant improvement over their previous fast simulation uh, that was using sort of classical techniques. Um, and here they even have good modeling in the boosted regime, which has traditionally been somewhat difficult for fast simulation. Um, so this uh, fast Cal again uh, is being considered for deployment in run three. Moving on to LHCB, uh, their full simulation uses up to 99% of their CPU time, and it's dominated by optical photon propagation and calorimeter showering. So they're developing a custom ultra-fast simulation called Lamar, which is even faster than a similar Delft setup, which is impressive by itself. Um, and one component of this is using uh, stacked GANs for particle ID, uh, which is one of the more intensive parts of their simulation. Um, you can see the, the depiction of their architecture here. 
Uh, they're also investigating GANs for calorimeter response and even uh, trying a VAE plus GAN architecture for this, um, although these investigations are still earlier. So there's some results here. Uh, the promising initial results for the PID uh, generation. Uh, you can see here that there's pretty good agreement between the data and what they get from their fast simulation using the GAN. And further optimizations are ongoing to improve slightly in some places where distributions aren't modeled completely correctly. The calorimeter GAN, as I said, is still a bit earlier. Uh, it reproduces some distributions well, like the transfers within the cluster, um, but some other marginal distributions that aren't directly targeted in the training uh, struggles a little bit, like the longitudinal asymmetry. And so work is still ongoing uh, to improve this. Uh, just a few notes on CMS. So CMS is full sim is four to six times faster than the baseline GM4, thanks to numerous optimizations and approximations and a sustained effort to commission and adopt new GAN4 versions that have uh, typically some speed ups. The CMS fast sim application is 60 to 100 times faster than the full sim. Uh, it includes both sim and recall level optimization, such as the uh, truth assisted tracking that I mentioned earlier. But currently it's not adopted so widely, it's used to generate large supersymmetric model scans and also some sources, uh, some studies of systematic uncertainties. And so because of all this work, CMS is well positioned for run three but further acceleration is crucial for phase two. Uh, so we're exploring the latest architectures and use cases described here, including the bounded information bottleneck, uh, the DCTR GAN end-to-end -end analysis specific regression and more. Um, some of our goals are to de develop common tools for comparisons of different approaches, such as using common data sets, common physics validation quantities and so forth, but this work is still ongoing. So to conclude, uh, ML provides numerous possibilities for fast and accurate detector simulation. It can augment existing full or fast simulation uh, or uh, explore end-to-end -end approaches as an interesting alternative. And generative or regressive uh, algorithms can be employed for this. There's significant research interest in improving the physical validity of results and many new architectures and approaches are under development. Experiments are starting to deploy GANs for fast simulation applications, uh, including the fast Calligan and Atlas and the particle ID GAN for LHCB. Going forward, we have an important transition from simplified examples to production ready implementations so that we can be prepared for the HLIC computing challenges in the experiments. And utilization of coprocessors and development of common resources are some bonuses that we can achieve from this. And I think this effort is also interesting to other fields that use Monte Carlo simulations, such as neutrinos or astrophysics or beyond. So thanks. Thank you, Kevin, for a nice overview. And so we can now go to the question. I don't see any. Oh, yes, there is uh, Andrea raising his hand. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kevin. This was a very, very interesting talk. Uh, I just, uh, you stressed that uh, accuracy, I mean, uh, physics validation is very important. Uh, but for instance, I mean, on slide seven, you were showing even a very nice plot with the uh, accuracy versus speed. Now, my question is, is, is there a consensus on what to use uh, as an evaluation metric, like to compare the accuracy of two methods? I mean, because the problem is that uh, it's very difficult to encapsulate accuracy in a single metric, but sometimes you actually need it. I mean, when you want to compare to methods, for instance. And I'm just wondering, could one of the loss functions which are used in one of these methods be used for that, actually? Yeah, so I think that's a very important uh, consideration. Um, and, and, and typically what I've seen uh, from, from looking at these different approaches and trying some of my own is that a lot of times you can have a loss function that, that expedites training but doesn't fully capture the physics. Um, and then, you know, you have to compare to other quantities that might not be in the loss function. These were the so-called marginal distributions in some of these slides. Uh, and so I agree, while it's nice to have a, a single metric that maybe we could eventually develop, but I don't think there's one that is capturing all of the uh, physics that we want it to right now. Um, so this is something we can think about, but I think in general, we, we should come up with sort of a, a suite of uh, different quantities to check. Um, and that, you know, maybe, maybe if you wanted to be really uh, tough on these algorithms, you could say that you you use whichever one it does the worst at to compare. <laughs> and then you really see, uh, you know, what, what the, uh, the worst case performance could be. But I think this is something that needs more thought. Thanks. Liz, would you like to ask a question? Yes. Uh, so if you have, um, 
a really successful machine learning uh, simulation, um, it still has to be trained on some um, data set. And if you want it labeled, it would should be the full simulation. How, but um, then it raises the question in my mind, how do you um, determine how much statistics you need in a training sample for any given you know, um, end analysis sample? Is there any feel for that? So I think, yeah, this is something that, that people have been discussing as these efforts have been taken more seriously. And I think the, uh, this paper here that I referenced on slide 11, uh, which is, is using a very simple case, not a detector simulation, but the point of it is to actually look at the statistical validity of these things. I think this could be used as a guide um, to figure out how, you know, given that you have some statistics in your training sample, you know, how far can you expect to uh, ex interpolate and then potentially extrapolate while still having a valid result? Okay, so this would say something around a ratio of one to 10,000 would get you something that's... Uh, that right, that's good. the sort of thing you can, you can and mm -hmm. it depends on, of course, the, I think the specific thing you're trying to simulate to some extent, but yeah, you, you could expect some kind of ratio like that, I think. Okay. And, and as I said, and I think near the beginning, uh, you know, I think we should, you know, do it when doing our accounting, include the generation simulation of those event training events and the actual training in our uh, cost benefit analysis, you know, rather than saying the inference is so fast uh, that we'll save all the CPU. We are spending some CPU to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marilena. Yeah, uh, hi, Kevin. I have a, a question about end-to-end -end, uh, approaches that you mentioned. Uh, I was curious to know if there are like successful uh, experience uh, of these end-to-end -end approaches and actually how many steps these are including, I mean, from which step to which other step, and if in your opinion that that's like a, a better direction where to focus the attention uh, instead of just focusing on a single step and make it uh, as much precise as possible with machine learning. So maybe including and convoluting different uh, steps uh, could actually lead to better results uh, using machine learning techniques? Right, I think that's a good question. So this paper here, as you can see, really just came out, <laughs> you know, like last month. Um, and I, I think really that the case that they target is, to me, the right way to target this end-to-end -end approach, which is to, to focus on a specific analysis. So here their quantities are, you know, the jet mass, the missing ET. So th this is sort of very end-stage uh, analysis variables. And so that means it includes essentially every step of the uh, you know, experiment software to get from the generated events to these end stage quantities. But it's targeted at a specific analysis where you expect that you know, the calibrations you're using, the reconstruction algorithms you're using are already essentially frozen by the time you're doing that analysis. I think to employ this as an experiment wide approach would be very difficult because it would have to constantly be updated for all those changes. But here in the case where a specific analysis needs, you know, to increase its, to decrease its statistical uncertainty in certain variables, I think it's very promising. But, uh, but I personally, as, as a general approach, lean more toward, you know, focusing on a specific step like GM4 where the scope can be very well understood and then a technique can be applied more generally than this specific one. But I, I think there's room for both is what I'm saying. Okay, thank you. I think we can take one last question. Sun Yang. Hey, uh, Kevin, a uh, very nice talk. And the, all these results I see is sort of a average response, you know, the well produced by fast sim approach. And, but the, the most of the uh, assumption inside to taking care of a uh, fluctuation is uh, basically normal, you know, the priority. So do you have any good example how uh, the past seem address the individual actually shape, uh, basically, you know, the fluctuation, uh, the quantities. For example, in the uh, longitudinal distribution, okay, average, you produce the average response very well, but how about the, you know, the, the each shower will be fluctuated uh, very quite, uh, 
the widely, right? For example, the hydronic in, uh, the uh, shape will be very different from you know the uh, the one shot to the other. So uh, the since all these are the sort of I think not Gaussian, right? It's uh, basically non-linear, you know the uh, the fluctuation. So I want to see sort of you know the, any detailed study how they address this type of uh, I think uh, problems. Right, so I mean, I think generically the, the answer to that is to look at higher moments of these shower quantities. Um, I'm trying to see if I have a plot that has some of those higher moments. And I'm not sure that I have one in here, but I think this is something that people generically have looked at. Yeah, I don't think I have a plot of the higher moments in here. Take but I think, this, jet, yeah, there's- hmm? take, take the jet mass, fast color, the fast color gun jet mass. Sorry, which one do you mean? <laughs> the, the Atlas Fast Color Gun Jet Mask. The Atlas one, okay, yes, uh, let's see. Right, so I mean, I think you could, you could look at higher moments of the distribution to understand how it's dealing with fluctuations. Um, but I mean, I, I, I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> Sorry, that, that's just that you, I think we can and we should look at those quantities. <laughs> okay. I think we now take thank you to Kevin and Marilena and Mark.